The story implies that there's an optimal size of the dragon. And I would say, well, your nervous systems are actually tuned to detect the optimal size of dragons. We'll, we'll talk about this in great detail as we go through the biology of anxiety and, and disgust, as it turns out, which is something I've learned more about recently. You know how you can... Sometimes if you're engaged in a task, let's say a cognitive task, you can find it overwhelming. It's right, something you're having a very difficult time understanding, and maybe you even wonder if you're up to it. Okay, so you might say, well, your nervous system is indicating to you that that's a threat. And then other times you'll be dealing, say, with a cognitive task that's beneath your abilities. And so it's easy and you get bored. So then you'll be dealing with a cognitive task that, that it's like Goldilocks and the three bears, right? The temperature is just right. And what happens is that you have to grapple with the task and it pushes you forward in your development, but it also really engages you. So you're tied right into it. It's really easy to remember and understand and you make progress and it's difficult and energy demanding, but you're completely captivated by the process. That's the right size dragon. And you, that's what your nervous system is telling you. It's saying, look, this, this amount of novel information in this domain is precisely the amount that, that you can incorporate while optimally transforming the knowledge structures that you already have without exceeding your capacity. And what that does, the way your nervous system signals that to you, is you get interested in it. You know, because you might, you might ask yourself, like, why do you get interested in things? And you're bored by some things, and some things are overwhelming. It's like, you don't have any choice about that. It's not a decision you make, right? It's something you discover as you act in the world. And so, dragons of optimal size are engaging, and they push your development. But if they get too big, then they're too much. Could this, could this dragon not be the child potential? Like, I see an analogy between this and the story with the baby in the crib and the... Thunder going, hitting everywhere. It, 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 yeah, it could be that. Like the thing about the thing about that particular symbol is that it describes the unknown outside of conceptualization. It's pure potential. Now, you know, here's something to think about in relationship to that. I did a little TED talk on potential, which if you're interested in this sort of thing, you might want to look look at because I I, I got it right in that talk, I thought. But you know, you there are different ways of thinking about what the world's made out of. And, you know, we think that it's made out of matter. That's the basic dogma, say, of, of, the, of the materialist realm. And I would say, look, it's really useful to treat the world as if it's made out of matter and look at all the things that treating it that way has allowed us to do. But that doesn't mean it's the final statement about the nature of reality. And whatever matter is, is pretty damn strange when you get to the bottom of it. We don't understand it at all, and we don't understand its relationship to consciousness. But putting that aside, we also act as if things other than matter are real. So, for example, we act as if potential is real. And that's a very strange thing, you know, because potential by its very nature is not really defined, because otherwise it wouldn't be potential, right? It would be actuality. But, you know, all of you understand your parents when they say, well, you know, you should live up to your potential. Or there's potential there. And I would say, actually, most of the time when we're dealing with the world, what we're dealing with is not the material world per se. What we're dealing with is potential. It's like what we're dealing with what this could be. And we're trying to realize the potential. And so another thing that you could think about at, think about with regards to the symbol of the dragon in particular, or it's the predatory, the predatory reptile more, more basically, is that it's a, it's a representation of potential. And so, and I, I think the reason that it takes reptilian form, and I, we're going to talk about this in great detail, is I think that what happened as we evolved is that the systems that we originally evolved to detect predators constituted, when, when, when we underwent the cognitive revolution that transformed the world into abstract representations around us, that initial pred predatory detection system was elaborated up into the system that we used to detect the unknown as such. But, you know, because it's evolution, the fundamental elements that evolved over the course of evolution remained intact. We're using the same systems. And that system has a language. And so the language is something like, well, the unexpected event is sort of like the snake in the grass, which is perfectly reasonable. You can think about it as a metaphor. It's, I think it's deeper than a metaphor, but you can think about it as a metaphor. And I would say, well, there are optimal sized... We have optimal sized adversaries. 
And I don't think you can live without an optimal sized adversary. Which is also an interesting, it's a very interesting idea because, you know, one of the things that people always ask, this is a very metaphysical discussion, is, you know, why there has to be evil and horror in the world. It's like, well, it's not clear to me that the world could be constituted in the manner that it's constituted in any acceptable way if there were no adversaries. It's like, well, maybe the snake in the garden is necessary. You know, maybe that imperfection and also that, that adversary is necessary. It's the thing that spurs on development. It, 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 what would there be without an adversary? Maybe nothing. You know, because you, like, I can give you an example. It's a funny example. There's this little animal whose name I cannot remember, unfortunately, but it lives in the ocean. And in its larval stage, it has a brain and it swims around. It's a little tiny thing. It swims around, you know, like a little plankton and so on. And then at some point during its development, it fastens itself onto a rock and it grows into something that sort of looks like a plant, you know. But it's stable. It never moves again. So as it develops into this stable, rock-clinging entity, it basically digests its own brain and then it doesn't need one after that. And the reason it doesn't need one is, well, there isn't really anything for it to do. It just sits there and filters water and takes like a sponge, sort of. It takes the, the uh, nutrients out of the water and the brain is just like it's extra energy using tissue. And so it doesn't need the brain anymore. And so, you know, it's like you don't need to think if you haven't got an adversary. So, so then you think, well, are there optimal sized adversaries? And part of the little motif of that story is... If you pay careful attention to things as they change, maybe you can keep the damn adversaries optimized. And I think that actually, it may not be true, but it's possible that it's true. And that's something, you know, that's something. If you really pay, because the question might be, and this is something that I thought about when I was developing all these ideas a long time ago, it's like, okay, well, there's obviously some things about existence that aren't exactly the way you might lay them out if you had the choice. You know, like the fact that people are fundamentally vulnerable and that you're imperfect in 50 different ways and that life is full of suffering and that everybody dies and, you know, all these things that are existential nightmares. It's like, okay, fine. It's easy to judge that as unacceptable and maybe even worse than unacceptable. You know, intolerable, un you know, um, deserving of obliteration. You can even go that far and people do go that far. But there's another question that that, that question begs, which is, yeah, maybe... But maybe if you brought all of your resources to bear on the problem, without holding back all of them, then that would be okay, then you could master it. And that's possible, you know? So you won't, the thing is, you'll never know unless you try it, that's the thing. Because it's, it, it, it's actually a claim that requires an existential proof. You can't listen to someone tell you that. And even if it's true for them, that doesn't necessarily mean it would be true for you. The only way you can test a proposition like that is existentially. You have to act it out. But as I mentioned earlier, I see very, very few truly optimistic ideas in profound thought. Most profound ideas are pretty damn pessimistic. But this is one I think that's an exception to that, which is it is possible that you're constituted so that you have enough resources to deal with reality as, it's actually, as it actually lays itself out. And one of the ways... And people have been thinking about this for a very long time, too, is that the, the most effective, one of the most effective weapons you have in that engagement is the capacity to pay attention. And paying attention, and it's another thing I've learned over the years and that's been extraordinarily useful to me. 